Bible warfare, how to defend your faith. Lesson number five, title of this lesson, What Makes the Church of Christ Unique? And this is part one. Well, I think that uh, most folks in this class know uh, our procedure and our purpose in this uh, particular series. I'm answering Bible questions that you've submitted about topics that you have been asked about and perhaps were not able to answer. Or they could be questions uh, you yourself have had uh, wanted uh, perhaps a clearer answer to. And I've broken the questions down into several categories and answer uh, one oft repeated question or several specialized questions each week. Uh, and I started with the questions that were most asked by, you know, by people. Uh, we've done those in the first uh, three or four lessons. In addition to this, we set up a kind of a ground rules to guide our discussions with other people when we talk to them about Bible or faith issues. Respect others' sincerity. Keep the discussion based on the Bible. And remember the, the, the sentence, the sentence that keeps the thing objective and not subjective, okay, is I believe that the Bible teaches and then go from there. Not I feel or I think, I believe that the Bible teaches and you go from there. And then of course, be patient, be patient. All right, so let's get to some of the questions. One of the questions that came up in uh, many different forms was, what's the difference between the Church of Christ and you fill in the blank, all right? You fill in the blank between any number of groups or denominations, Catholic, Protestants, Baptists, Methodists, whatever, Jehovah Witnesses. What's the difference? Now I've put all of these questions together because the essential difference between the Church of Christ and other churches, whether they be Roman Catholic or mainline Protestant, evangelical, sectarian groups like uh, the Mormons, the difference is always the same. In the simplest of terms, the difference is this. We are consciously striving to be a New Testament church and they, whoever they are, are not. That's the basic difference. Now some, especially among the evangelical churches, may claim to be New Testament churches, but they neither understand nor practice true New Testament style Christianity and church organization. So, the question that naturally follows this statement is, what then is a New Testament church? If that's the way we're different than all the other groups, what is that? Well, there are two parts to this answer. One is theological, we're different theologically, and we're also different historically. We'll take the theological difference first. New Testament churches, like the Church of Christ, are different theologically than others because our approach to the Bible, the source for Christian theology, theology, by the way, the study of God and all that relates to God, we are different in our approach to theology than other groups in two basic ways. Number one, we believe that the Bible is completely inspired by God and is the only and final authority in spiritual matters. That is the bedrock basis of the difference between churches of Christ and all other, uh, quote, Christian groups. For example, in 2 Timothy 3.16, the Bible says, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Notice it says all scripture, not some scripture. All scripture is inspired by who? By God. And then it goes on, or Paul goes on to explain how we use the scriptures. We use them to teach and to reprove for correction, for training, and so on and so forth. In opposition to this, Roman Catholics, for example, believe that the Pope and church tradition has equal authority to the Bible. Protestants, some, don't accept all as inspired and include the teachings of their founders, like Calvin, Luther, as authoritative. 
Evangelicals, on the other hand, for the most part, agree with us on this particular point. Various sects, you know, when I mention a sect, I'm talking about Jehovah Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists, various sects give equal authority to their prophets and founding leaders as they do to the Bible. There's always, well, there's the Bible and then there's the, the Book of Mormon. There's the Bible and then there's this other book that we use in combination for our religious theological authority. So when you have one church that considers the Bible as the only and complete inspired authoritative document from God, and then other groups who only accept parts of the Bible or they include information from other sources as authoritative, you're bound to have different outcomes sooner or later. For example, we in the Churches of Christ believe that homosexuality is a sin and it is an unacceptable lifestyle because in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Bible says so. In the Old Testament, Leviticus 18, verse 22, that's just one reference. In the New Testament, Romans chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, very clearly denounces there's not even the word homosexual that exists in the Bible. That's a word made up to explain that activity. In the Bible, there's no Greek word that says homosexual. It's actually a phrase. Men sleeping with other men as they do with women. <laughs> That's how it's explained. It's not explained as a style of life, it's explained as an action. Okay? And then it is denounced. Many Roman Catholics believe that homosexuals can remain this way without change because the Pope has made a special provision for them in the church. The, the most recent Pope has accepted the idea that there is a genetic source for homosexuality, completely unscientific. Don't know where he got that, but. In some Methodist and Presbyterian churches, homosexuals can become ordained ministers because many of their leaders do not consider the epistles of Paul as being inspired. So if you can, if you can say, well, Paul, you know, sometimes he was inspired and sometimes he was not, well, <laughs> you're going to get a different, you know, you're going to get a different result for sure. Many in the denominational world see Paul's epistles as simply the work of a human being, a prejudiced human being. The argument being, well, you know, Paul was a product of his time and in those days homosexuality was looked down upon and so therefore it was natural that he would you know, be negative about homosexual, but we've, you know, we've evolved, we've grown. Now I choose this example because it is so glaring but there are a thousand other differences because we, as a New Testament church, see the Bible as fully inspired. And we see it as the single uh, religious authority that guides our moral and spiritual lives. And other people, other groups, either take away some parts of the Bible or they add to it in some way. And so they come to a different conclusion because of that. So when you do this, you get a different result and a conclusion on issues of faith and practice. For example, if I don't believe that the writings of Paul are part of the inspired record, well then I can use instruments in worship because it's Paul that writes about this idea that you know, sing, when you worship, sing. Or I can have uh, women uh, be elders in the church because Paul is the one that writes about this particular issue. And I can organize the church like a business or a government or a royal thing, you know, as many churches do because most of the information on these matters come from Paul's epistles. And if they're not inspired or authoritative, then I can do what seems best to me. The thing that people don't realize, however, is that Paul also talks eloquently about salvation in the book of Ephesians, and he describes the, the, the gifts and the rewards that God has prepared for all those who remain faithful. So if you, <laughs> if you want to you you know, discount Paul as an inspired authority for issues like homosexuality and the role of women in the church, well, you also have to discount 
whatever he says about the gifts that we're receiving from God. You, know, you can't pick and choose. You either reject it all or you accept it all. Of course, the Bible does say something about this as well. Proverbs 30, do not add to his words or he will reprove you and you will be proved a liar. 1 Corinthians 4, 6, now these things, brethren, I figuratively apply to myself and Apollos for your sake, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. Revelation chapter 22, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues which are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his part from the tree of life and from the holy city, which are written in this book. Notice that Solomon and Paul and John restated the same idea that God forbids any tinkering with his word, no adding, no, sub, no subtracting. And so churches of Christ, as New Testament churches, we take this command literally and we accept the entire Bible as inspired by God, and we are careful not to add or change or eliminate any part of it. That's the thing, well, one of the things that makes us different than other groups. Now, hear what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we understand everything in the Bible. I'm not saying that our teachings are all perfect, no fault. You know, we understand every idea, every doctrine, every, like we get everything. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we accept the fact that the Bible itself is perfect. The Bible itself is fully inspired. And we are doing our very best to understand it and to obey it. We're not saying we do that perfectly. You know, I tell people, but I think you know, we're not perfect, but, but we've got the right target. We're shooting at the right thing. We're trying to do the things of God given to us in the Bible according to the way God has given it to us. That's the right target. Now, another thing, so that's one thing. You know, why, how, why are we different? How are we different? Well, that's one way very important way. We accept the Bible as fully inspired. And many, many religious groups that claim Christ as Lord do not. Another thing that creates differences between us and others from the theological perspective is our approach to interpreting and applying God's word in our lives in practical ways. In other words, we believe that it's inspired, but we have a method of studying it in order to arrive at a consistent conclusion every time. For example, Roman Catholics see the Bible as a basis from which to begin their religious ideas, which are then developed by papal teaching and church practice and tradition, church tradition, even if it contradicts the Bible. How, how would you say? Well, they add festivals, they add doctrines, they add laws, they add hierarchy, not in the Bible, not even spoken in the Bible. You know, the doctrine of, uh, of uh, Mary being assumed into heaven, you know, transported into heaven like Elijah, you know, that, that's not written in the Bible anywhere, they just made that up, whole cloth. Th that the Pope, that the Pope is um, infallible when he speaks, as we say, ex cathedra, meaning when he speaks from the chair of Peter, he's infallible, no mistakes. They made that up. That, 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 that was put together 125 years ago and, and it passed the vote of, you know, among cardinals or many cardinals that voted against it who actually knew the Bible and were saying, no, that, you can't do that. And uh, yeah, they won, they won the vote and that became part of uh, Catholic uh, theology and doctrine. Nowhere in the Bible says that. So you know, they add stuff. I mean, I could go on and on. You know. Protestants, 
They do the same, except they have a variety of practices and traditions developed by many teachers since they rejected the authority of the Pope and put it into the hands of their scholars. So modern Protestantism is largely driven by their academics who have long ago abandoned the Bible as the final authority. I tell people, you go to Harvard Theological Seminary, you're lucky if you get out of there still believing in God. <laughs> Never mind the Bible. This has led to their synods or associations or conventions becoming the place where things become decided and not simply by the Bible. You know, the idea of allowing homosexuals to, serve, to openly serve, to be openly gay, to be practicing as a gay person and then to be serving as a minister of the church. How did that happen? Well, it happened. You know, the academics began to you know, undermine the authority of the inspiration of the scriptures. And then at conventions and synods, they took a vote. They took a vote. And what they decided with a vote became doctrine for them. So how are we different? <laughs> we never sit around and take a vote to figure out what the doctrine is. This is why they have so many different groups. Each group can exist separately from the other because it's all about Individualism. I'm, I'm talking about now evangelicals, for example. For evangelicals, the Bible is a resource book. A good book, an inspired book, but it's a resource for a happy and satisfying life here and a book that gives them a glimpse into the future, heaven, so on and so forth. So the multiplication of groups under the evangelical banner is increasing each year because as a subjective process, there is no way to decide which group is legitimate or not. You got the first Baptist, the second Baptist, the third Baptist church, the fourth Baptist. Yeah. The minute somebody deviates from a, you know, a doctrine, they have another idea on stuff, well, they just form a new group. Missionary Baptist, new missionary Baptist. The sects, Jehovah Witness, Mormon, Seventh-day Adventist, they focus, uh, they focus in exclusively on one doctrine or key idea in the Bible in order to separate themselves from other groups and justify their existence. The Jehovah Witnesses, God's name. The Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Adventist, the Sabbath. And from this base, they evolve an entirely new religious experience and group, all based on. Note that the one thing that causes the differences between all of these religious groups, all claiming Christ as Lord, is the way they approach and apply the Bible to their lives as believers and their organization and function as churches. That's what makes them different. Because of this, we have a special way to study and apply its teachings to both our personal and church life. We do. This approach, this method that we have that gives us the results that we have and makes us unique among every other church and religious group out there because we in the churches of Christ are the only ones using this approach. This approach that I'm talking about, this way to practice or to apply our theology is called pattern theology. Based on the instruction of several scriptures. In 2 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Retain, keep. The standard, keep what I've given to you, maintain what I've given to you, he says. The teachings that I've given to you, that Paul gave to Timothy, retain these, hang on to these. In Jude 3, Jude says, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. So what is, what is Jude asking here? 
He says, I felt it necessary to write to you appealing that you what? You contend, you fight for. Fight for what? You fight in order to maintain. To maintain what? He says, the faith. There's an article there in the Greek. There's faith, like I trust you, I have faith in you, I believe. There's that faith. And then there's the faith, which is a body of doctrine, a body of teaching. So here you see it, the article that you contend earnestly for what? For the faith, the body of teaching, the body of doctrine, and what does he say? Which was once for all handed down to the saints. Everything that God wanted to give to the church, that body of doctrine, he has already given it. So you know, when I hear, you know, 60 minutes, whoa, new scripture, new epistle found, you know, they've got a new, no. There's no more, we have it all. We've got it all. They may have written others, but they're, they're lost. We know that Paul wrote more epistles than he did, but they were lost. So here's the thinking behind this. In these two scriptures and others, the apostles are encouraging the church to maintain the integrity of this body of information. You have this body of information, he says, and your job is not only to maintain it and teach it, but maintain it in its purity and hand it down to the next generation, who will then do the same. They will teach it, maintain it, you know, keep it pure, and hand it down to the following generation. And if we don't think that that's an important idea, <laughs> take a look around. Take a look around at, at what, the people, what people have tried to do with the Bible. Tear it up, take things out, add stuff to it. Of course, that's the job. That's, that's the work that we've, been, uh, that we've been given to do. Let me give you an example how pattern theology works. This here is a, uh, just a picture of you know, when they came out with the new series of quarters. They were minted you know, with a special design for every state. This is the one that they minted for the state of Oklahoma. It's got the regular, you know, the front, and then on the back it's got uh, you know, Oklahoma and the scissor tail and all that stuff. Now, at the mint, they have the original die or pattern for this particular coin. And so long as they have the raw materials, they can produce an unlimited number of coins which are exactly like the original in every way. Well, this idea exists in every industry. You create an original pattern and you produce any number of copies from that original pattern for dresses, for steering wheels, for can openers, anything. Well, if we apply this idea to religion, the pattern theology approach says the following. The Bible contains all the patterns necessary to produce all facets of spiritual life. What we have here is a book of patterns, a book of blueprints. Okay? These include, but are not limited to, the pattern for how one becomes a disciple of Jesus. Someone says, well, I want to be a disciple of Jesus. How do I do that? Well, and one guy says, well, oh, well, clap your hands three times and jump up in the air three times saying, Jesus, and you, you'll be one of his disciples. And the guy goes, really? Yeah, that's, I, yeah. And then the other guy says, well, let's look at the Bible and see <laughs> what the Bible says about how you become a disciple. And I mean, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here. When you read slowly but surely, you, you find out, well, wait a minute, if you want to be a disciple, Matthew 28, you, know, uh, you, need to be, you need to believe in Jesus, you need to repent of your sins, you need to be baptized. You know, all these things are necessary to become a disciple. How do we know that? Well, the Bible contains the pattern that teaches us how to do that thing. The Bible contains the pattern for how to organize Jesus' church. This is where the term, by the way, New Testament church comes from. A New Testament church is the church that is organized according to the pattern for church organization found in the New Testament. 
And so the short form for that is New Testament church. New Testament church is a church which is established, organized, and functions according to the pattern for this given in the New Testament. Now we see a pattern for some practice or experience because through direct communication or examples or basic logic, the Bible gives us a pattern of teaching to follow for everything. The pattern for proper service the pattern for personal spiritual growth, the pattern for resolving issues, the pattern for choosing leaders, and the list goes on and on and on and on. So we are different from others because everything we attempt to do is done with this approach in mind. Now we don't always say what's the pattern, even though that's technically the correct thing. We usually say, what does the Bible say? Well, it's the same thing. How does the Bible tell us to do such and such? I mean, you, know, you have a personal dispute with someone. The Bible has a pattern for how to resolve a dispute that you have with someone else. A classic example, of course, on a, on a larger scale, is the issue of the use of instruments in public worship. We are different than others because we are among the only ones who are a cappella or singing only in worship. Every other group uses instruments. Well, every other group, again, uh, except the Greek Orthodox Church, they don't use instruments because Greek, they, <laughs> they speak Greek, they understand the language. So when they read the New Testament in the Greek, they understand that singing, you know, that's the way you're supposed to worship in public. So they don't use instruments. We, do not use instruments because when we ask ourselves, what is the New Testament pattern or blueprint for public worship? When we ask that question and begin you know, scouring the New Testament, we find out certain things about this topic. For example, in every passage that gives information about music in worship, the command or the instruction or the example given to us is that we should sing without the use of musical instruments. Now people, I, I've answered this before, but people say, oh well yeah, they sang in the Old Testament. That's not the question. They also offered bulls and goats in the Old Testament as well. You want to do that too? We're interested in how does God want us to you know, offer public worship according to the New Testament? So 1 Corinthians 14, Ephesians 5, Colossians 3, James 5, we can go on and on, every time music in worship is discussed in the New Testament. It is always discussed with the idea that Christians will sing to offer public worship. You know, it's interesting to note also that the specific word used in the Greek translated to sing was the word salo, which specifically meant to sing without the use of instruments. It was the Greek way of saying a cappella type singing. Now, there are 181,253 words in the King James Version of the New Testament, and not a single one makes any reference to the use of musical instruments in Christian worship. Well, how did we, how did we get there? We got there because somebody just set this aside and said, yeah, well, uh, we're going to do it this way, because they're doing it. Okay, so the pattern of teaching in the New Testament on this subject, music and worship, shows us in clear terms that in public worship we are to sing without the use of instruments. So here's the point. If we want to be a popular church and reach younger people, youth group, millennials, I mean, it's a lot better to have a well-produced musical worship service with a professional group of musicians, drama, you know, cartoons, whatever. If you want to get people to, you know, young people, get them interested. You know, the end justifies the means. How can it be wrong? We got so many young people coming to church. How can it be wrong? That's the ends justifying the means. If we want to create impact, bring visitors, get people involved, start a band, get going with a choir, 
If on the other hand, we want to be exactly like the church described in the Bible, oh, well then that's going to be different. Then we're going to follow the pattern for New Testament worship and have all the church sing praises to God without any accompanying instruments, regardless of what's in style, regardless of what's happening in other churches. This will make us different, but not because we don't use instruments, most others do. No, we're different because we have deliberately and consciously chosen to follow carefully and as exactly as we can the teaching in the New Testament about this particular thing. That doesn't make us legalists. Some people say, you're so legalist, you're so, you know, so conservative, so narrow. No, 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 no. No, 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 that makes me a lover of God. That's what that makes me. That's what that makes me. It makes me a lover of God, why? Because I want to do what God wants me to do more than anything else. I don't care about being popular. I don't care about that. I only care about pleasing the Lord. That's all I care about. So this, this is what makes us different. We're trying to follow the pattern while others are not dedicated to this objective. I'm not saying that other people are not sincere or they're bad people. I'm just saying that they're not dedicated to what we're dedicated to. And a lot of times, a lot of people in our congregation don't understand this idea. You know, when was the last time you had a class about pattern theology, right? It's the thing that appealed to me the most when I became a Christian. I was looking for explanations, you know, because I grew up Catholic, as you know. Why are they doing this and why are they doing that? And, you know, and I read, I'd read the Bible and... And then when somebody finally explained to me you know, the approach, oh, well, yeah. This is what creates the similarity between us and other people at times. This is why there can be 13,000 congregations of the churches of Christ in the United States alone without any hierarchy beyond the local church. We don't have a state group union. We don't have some big honcho in Dallas you know, running the show. You know. No, the highest authority in our churches are our elders. And if Harold, for example, and Jane decided to move to Dallas to be closer to some of their grandchildren and they started going to another congregation of the church, he wouldn't be an elder anymore. It's not transferable. I mean, they could ask him, obviously, with his experience, so on and so forth. But you know what I'm saying? You can only be a leader in your local church. Why do we do it that way? Because that's the way it's done in the New Testament and not just one leader per congregation, according to the pattern of the New Testament, always a plurality of elders, a, collegiate, a collegial type of, of, of leadership is what, we, is what we practice. So 13,000 congregations, some are big, some are small, some are dynamic, others are kind of you know, bumping along, you know, but the thing that we all have in common is that we all are devoted to following the patterns in the New Testament for our practice of Christianity in every area of life. Some churches seem to be able to do that real well, others you know, are struggling, but we're all agreed. And if you travel at all and if you, you know, go to different places and you go to churches, you, know, you walk in and you go, yep. <laughs> And sometimes you walk in, I mean, you, know, you think you're, you're in the right place and there's a big piano and the band in the front, and you go, okay, I'm not in the right place. <laughs> I mean, Baptists, you know, they believe Jesus is the Son of God, and so do we. We're, in the same, we're, we're the same in this because they follow the pattern of teaching about the identity of Christ, and so do we. It's just that they don't follow the pattern of teaching about all the other stuff as well. Now what usually creates the differences and makes us unique is that the churches of Christ are dedicated to trying to follow the New Testament pattern for everything pertaining to our spiritual lives and faith and other groups are not. Sometimes they do it and sometimes they don't. 
We, on the other hand, try to do it every time. Again, it doesn't mean we succeed. It doesn't mean we succeed. But we do try. We know what we're trying to do and who we're trying to be. Okay, I've got too much material to do in one class, so we're going to talk about the history of this next week.